Guy Lawton, the law guy here. Today I want to talk to you about a United States legal concept called the Sony Rule. But first, a little bit of background. In the US, intermediary copyright liability has developed through torts law. There are three main ways that an intermediary can be found liable. First, contributory infringement. Secondly, vicarious liability. And the third and more modern development is something called inducement. In the 1970s, Sony developed technology called the Betamax Videotape Recorder. Universal Studios and Walt Disney then took them to court, arguing that they were indirectly liable for the primary infringements of the consumers who used that system to record copyright owned by Universal Studios and Walt Disney. The Supreme Court did not hold Sony liable, and in their reasoning, something called the Sony Rule was born. The Supreme Court drew an analogy with the Patents Act Staple Article of Commerce Doctrine in determining this new rule. They said, Accordingly, the sale of copying equipment, like the sale of other articles of commerce, does not constitute contributory infringement if the product is widely used for legitimate, unobjectionable purposes. Indeed, it need merely be capable of substantial non-infringing uses. Evidence showed that consumers primarily used the system for something called time shifting, which was a non-infringing use. The Sony rule is a, is a pretty reasonable doctrine when you think about it. It would be strange to hold a battery salesman liable for the act of a third party who uses that battery for nefarious purposes, like creating a bomb. So how does the Sony rule apply now in this online world? Napster developed one of the first peer-to-peer -peer networks that allowed users to download music in an mp3 format. The Napster system utilized the central server in A&M Records Incorporated and Napster Incorporated. The courts held that Napster was liable for the infringement of its consumers because they found that Napster had actual knowledge and constructive knowledge of the infringing use. The courts also stated that the Sony rule only applies to contributory infringement. In Metro Goldwyn, Mayer's Studio Incorporated and Groska Limited, the courts further narrowed the application of the Sony rule. The appeal court held that the Sony rule would preclude Groska from liability as the software had substantial non-infringing uses and that due to the lack of a centralized server, Groska the developer did not have any knowledge or constructive knowledge of the consumer's infringing use. However, the Supreme Court overturned the appeal court's decision, but for reasons other than the Sony rule. They actually agreed with the Court of Appeal in that the Sony rule would preclude Grotzka from liability had the evidence only been limited to the characteristics of the product. But the evidence went beyond that. The Supreme Court held Grotzka liable because they induced their users to use the product for infringing purposes. It stated that the Sony rule does not displace other forms of secondary liability. So if you're looking to develop some new technology, like the iPod, or some new software for peer-to-peer -peer file transferring, the Sony rule will protect you from the contributory infringement as long as the non-infringing use is substantial. Even if you do recognize that users could use your product for infringing uses, just as long as you don't have actual knowledge or constructive knowledge and or that you don't induce consumers to use your product for infringing reasons. By doing so, you leave the boundaries of the Sony rule and the test won't be able to protect you from liability.